It's time for All About Pentecost. Here's your host, Pastor Daniel Gamble. Welcome everyone to the second episode of All About Pentecost. If you have not already watched the previous episode, I want you to go preferably and listen to that one before this because each one builds upon another, but at least go back and listen to it after the fact. Today we're going to be talking about what tongues actually are and what their purposes are. As discussed previously, there is a great misunderstanding with both opponents of modern Pentecost and quite frankly, with many of its practitioners. What? Many Pentecostal movements do not possess adequate doctrinal understanding for what they do, why they do it, uh, or even if they should do it at all. If you ask many of them why they do something or why they believe it, they will say, I don't know, you just have to experience it. Well, that's a problem. Because although there is an illumination and understanding that arises from the Spirit of God Himself, and the carnal mind cannot understand the things which are spiritual. But when there is this lax in doctrine and understanding, it leads to all kinds of craziness in the church, like eating grass. just amazes me what uh, some people will do in the name of religion but uh, this I believe it's the same guy it might be another uh, wacko out there that believes that whatever he prays over even if it's an inedible thing that if he prays over it all of a sudden it becomes uh, food and uh, this guy goes over to this lady's hair Uh, she's got a weave in it or whatever those things are called you ladies know that And he prays over that woman's hair and he says, it's no longer hair, it's food. And and people start attacking this lady to rip the hair, uh, the weave off of her head. Uh, And then they start eating the hair. Don't believe me, look at it. Once again, I don't know whether uh, this is the same guy or not. It's probably somebody else. In the name of deliverance, he tells these people to strip down to their underwear in the altar. And they do it. Well, but Africa is not the only place that has these kind of weirdos. Uh, There is in America a lady by the name, you can find out her name. There's no point in me mentioning it, but uh, you can find it on YouTube. Type in Shaking Prophetess. I, I can't even describe what this lady does. Just watch. I was in the room. When the Holy Spirit first fell on David Roos like that. God began to talk to us about a move of the Spirit that would come. My goodness gracious. Uh, If you want to see something else here, this is also funny. And I did not come up with this name. It was, uh, it's just what you have to search to find it. Look on YouTube and search Crazy White People Church. Now, undoubtedly, some who have heard uh, that are listening to this and have watched this video have probably been in a service similar to this where this kind of stuff has gone on with people running the aisles and things. Well, running the aisles is the least uh, 
thing that we need to worry about in this clip. I want you to look over here in the corner. Look at where that arrow is pointing for you. And I want you to watch because a guy is getting ready to come into the screen where that arrow is. And I want you to watch and see what this guy does. <laughs> it's, it, it, it's amazing. Watch it. Foolish birds of the red fire. Now I'm sorry, but God did not tell, the Holy Ghost did not tell that man to barrel roll onto the stage and, and then jump with his clothes on into the baptistry. Maybe the guy needed to be baptized, but that is not how it is done. And of course, we know that it's not, but the Holy Spirit, his job is to point people to Christ. And when you do that kind of stuff, uh, you're not pointing people to Christ. You're getting people to look at you. And that is wrong. But uh, we've got one more thing. Watch the entire clip. It's hilarious. Watch what happens next. Watch where this arrow is pointing to what happens to the guy on the stage. Well, and I, my goodness gracious, I don't know whether that guy who's singing goes to that church or he's visiting, but you can tell he can't even hardly sing because he's laughing so much. Uh, but I, I want to go ahead and tell you, the Holy Ghost did not tell that man to throw his coat and hit that singer in the face. And if you ever come to my church and you throw your coat at me, you're going to be asked to leave. That is not of God. I got one more clip before we go on. I think this is hilarious. This is a, a, a clip of the kind of antics that goes on in the Pentecostal church. And I want you to look at this lady to the right. The, there's a guy that's going to fall on the ground and a guy that's going to kind of get over to him. And this guy kind of falls. And I don't think she really does this. <laughs> Really? Many of the antics in the Pentecostal church are not biblical or orderly at all. People do them. I believe that most people who do them are not doing it to be uh, out of order. They're not doing it to be malicious. They really believe that that's the way they're supposed to act because they've witnessed other people doing it or they've been told that's the way it's supposed to be done. Things like running the aisles, rolling around on the ground and shaking and convulsing and screaming and yelling. These things are often blamed on the Holy Ghost. But it is not the Holy Ghost that makes you do these things. Somebody might say, well, it just hits me and I, I can't control it. Well, listen, if you've got something you can't control, you've got something you need cast out of you because the Holy Spirit is a gentleman. He does not force you to do anything at all. The Bible even says that the Spirit is subject to the prophet. And so if you're doing something that you can't control, it's not God, it's the devil. The spirits of prophets are subject to prophets. For God is not a God of confusion but of peace. 1 Corinthians 14, 32b through 33a. There's a lot of mess that has gone on in the name of spirituality, and it's not biblical, it's not of God, and it's hurting the church. 
and it's hurting and preventing the Holy Ghost from doing the work that he really wants to do. Now I want to talk about one more thing to help illustrate this point before we go on. I'm not going to say any names. There's no point in saying names. It would not add to the argument and I do not want to cause undue embarrassment to this individual should they come across this. But there was an individual that I knew that was talking about um, the different ways that they had seen people shout in church services and, and different ways that they'd seen people react. And this person who was uh, was commenting that he had witnessed some people doing the chi like something like the chicken dance, you know, the chicken dance thing. <laughs> Well, this man, this young man said, I will never, ever do that. He said, well, one day we were in a service and the move of God and the power of God was moving. And his wife was saying that she was singing in the choir. And all of a sudden she looked up and her husband was out in the aisle doing the chicken dance. And it was made out to be as though the Holy Spirit made this man do the very thing that he said he would never do. I want to go out on a limb here, and actually it's not much of a limb. The Holy Ghost did not make you do the chicken dance. Now, I'm not saying that the people who've done these things do not feel the Holy Spirit. Uh, the presence of God is a tremendous feeling. Uh, oftentimes when I feel the presence of God, it's so strong that I will fall to my knees uh, because I feel as though I cannot stand. I'm not worthy to stand in the presence of God. But I've never lost my faculties or lost control. When you feel these things, you may choose to react a certain way, but the Holy Spirit does not make you do it. And before you behave that way, there are some things you need to consider. Well, I'm just not going to quench the Holy Ghost. It's not the Holy Ghost that you're trying to quench here. It's your flesh that you need to bring under control. Listen to what the Bible says about the matter. If, therefore, the whole church comes together and all speak in tongues, and outsiders or unbelievers enter, will they not say that you are out of your minds? 1 Corinthians 1423. Now there are some things that opponents of modern Pentecost and even practitioners of modern Pentecost are perhaps confused about and some of them are just flat out wrong. Some of the most common statements outside of cessationist claims that we talked about in a previous episode are this. Number one, tongues are a prayer language. Number two, tongues are the ability to go into other lands and to miraculously speak uh, their language without having learned it. That tongues are a sign of who was a real evangelist or who was a real prophet and who was false in apostolic times. There's always, there's another thing, number four, there always has to be an interpreter when someone speaks in tongues. And number five, Speaking in tongues is by demonic possession. Heard that quite a few times. And number six, speaking in tongues is something that you are taught how to do. Now, some of these things are just a matter of confusion, and others are just flat out wrong. Let's tackle them all one by one. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as a fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Acts of the Apostles 2, 1-4 now, I want you to notice something here from these scriptures. 
The people who witnessed those who had just received the baptism of the Holy Spirit think that these people are drunk. So apparently they were acting a little strange, perhaps staggering about. Now that adds some evidence that there may be some strange behavior or um, some visible effects of the presence of God being upon the, an individual. But there, as we've seen, there has to be a limit to these things uh, because it was obviously controllable because Peter called them all to attention and he didn't have any difficulty getting them to pay attention at that point. It's clear also that many, if not most of those field on the day of Pentecost, were speaking other human languages but that does not mean that that is all that the gift of tongues really is now when you look at the word tongue in the original language uh, it literally the gift of tongues literally means the gift of languages but we cannot forget what Paul said that he speaks in languages of both men and angels if I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. 1 Corinthians 13, 1 So when modern skeptics analyze tongues and declare it to be no language at all, uh, I will agree with you that there are people that are faking it. But it also could be one of many things. It could be an ancient language uh, that is now extinct, that nobody knows, that we have no way of telling whether it's that or not. They could be speaking in an angelic language that really you would have no way of knowing. What? Uh, but there's also uh, another explanation. It might actually be what we would consider gibberish. What? Did that Pentecostal preacher just say that people who are speaking in tongues might actually be speaking gibberish? Well, yes, that's what I said. Oh, no. Other languages are not the only way God said that he would speak to his people. Let's look at what the Old Testament says. For with stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to this people. Isaiah 28 11. Now I'm terrible at these pronunciations. Most of the time I just uh, make one up. But for sake of that authenticity and accuracy, let's get a recording of what this word actually is. The word for stammering here in the Hebrew is Strong's H 3934. La egg. La egg. And that literally means buffoonish, stuttering. Nonsense to speak unintelligibly. So ecstatic utterances are actually biblical, and God said that He would speak to His people in that way. Now I know that we can look at the context of that verse, and we can see that a lot of commentators believe that God was actually talking about the Assyrians that the Assyrian language was very similar to Hebrew, but yet it differed enough to where it would have sounded as gibberish to the Jews. But it is actually Paul himself who brings this into an argument and applies it to tongue. In the law it is written, By people of strange tongues and by the lips of foreigners will I speak to this people, and even then they will not listen to me says the Lord. Thus tongues are a sign not for believers but for unbelievers, while prophecy is a sign not for unbelievers but for believers. 1 Corinthians 14, 21 through 22 Such utterances would not be beneficial in trying to communicate the gospel to a native tribe in Africa, but this brings us to the fact that there are actually multiple purposes for tongues.
Tongues, number one, are a prayer language. Likewise the Spirit helps us in our weakness. For we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. Romans 8.26 Now I don't really like that uh, terminology because it's unnecessarily limiting. Tongues are prayer language for the individual's personal edification, uh, as the scripture says this. For one who speaks in a tongue speaks not to men but to God. For no one understands him, but he utters mysteries in the spirit. The one who speaks in a tongue builds up himself, but the one who prophesies builds up the church. 1 Corinthians 14, 2 and 4 But the reason why I believe it's unnecessarily limiting to call it a prayer language is there are actually several other purposes for tongues. Another purpose for tongues is for the corporate edification or for the benefit of the entire body. Now I want you all to speak in tongues, but even more to prophesy. The one who prophesies is greater than the one who speaks in tongues, unless someone interprets, so that the church may be built up. Now, brothers, if I come to you speaking in tongues, how will I benefit you unless I bring you some revelation or knowledge or prophecy or teaching? If even lifeless instruments, such as the flute or the harp, do not give distinct notes, how will anyone know what is played? And if the bugle gives an indistinct sound, who will get ready for battle? So with yourselves, if with your tongue you utter speech that is not intelligible, how will anyone know what is said? For you will be speaking into the air. There are doubtless many different languages in the world, and none is without meaning, but if I do not know the meaning of the language, I will be a foreigner to the speaker and the speaker a foreigner to me. So with yourselves, since you are eager for manifestations of the Spirit, strive to excel in building up the church. 1 Corinthians 14, 4 through 12. These verses explain uh, and are talking about when an interpreter is needed uh, in the church. Now, we're going to talk more about that in the next episode, so I don't want to spend the time here. We're going to go over the rules surrounding this function. Uh, but I want you to see one last thing. Another purpose of tongues is not really one that I've heard anywhere else. Uh, I'm sure I'm not the only one who, who sees this, but it does seem pretty, pretty clear to me that tongues are for worship. We do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. Acts of the Apostles 2.11 What everyone heard on the day of Pentecost, they heard these individuals speaking in their own language, but what they heard was them worshiping and glorifying God. And so an individual can be swept up in a moment of glory and express adoration to God in an unknown tongue. There are even those who sang in tongues. For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays but my mind is unfruitful. What am I to do? I will pray with my spirit, but I will pray with my mind also, I will sing praise with my spirit, but I will sing with my mind also. 1 Corinthians 14 14 through 15 Now, the claim that those who speak in tongues are doing so by demonic power almost doesn't deserve answering, but uh, I need to do it, I guess. This is a lie that was promoted by the Catholic Church around 1000 AD with some earlier appearances here or there because those who were filled with the Spirit were speaking against the Catholic Church. Oh no! Imagine that. What? I even had a Baptist friend use this one on me back in the day. 
Uh, now, remember, I was preaching when I was 14 to 15 years old. I was the Jesus freak of the school. And, and this Baptist friend, we were having a conversation about tongues, and they claimed that those who did it did it by demonic power. And I just looked at them and said, do you really believe that I am possessed by a demon? <laughs> they realized the foolishness of their argument. They said no, and they moved on from that claim. Are there those that are demon-possessed to speak in counterfeit tongues? Yes, there are. There are Mormons who claim to speak in tongues. There are uh, Muslims who claim to speak in tongues. There are absolutely individuals who fake speaking in tongues or do so by demonic power. But do you really believe that millions of Christians in this world are really all demon-possessed. Tongues are something that can be taught. No, they can't. At least not the real ones. Now, there may be some confusion here when, uh, when outsiders see uh, someone who is seeking the baptism of the Holy Ghost being encouraged to speak or to yield to the Spirit. Uh, but I don't believe that's always the case because I actually know people who say they were taken into a Sunday school classroom and taught how to speak in tongues. I'm sorry, guys. That is not the Holy Ghost. That is fanatical baby talk. <laughs> Now, maybe that's why there's so much wrong with the Pentecostal church. Maybe there are more tongue talkers who've been taught how to speak in tongues rather than were actually filled with the Holy Ghost. Yes. And before you charismatics get angry with me, remember, I am a Pentecostal preacher. I am unashamed of the power of the Holy Ghost. But some things that needed to be said for a long time, and there needs to be a reckoning in the Pentecostal church. As to the claim that tongues were, in the apostolic age, a sign uh, as to who was a true evangelist or who was a true prophet, so that churches would know who the real deal was. That's not what the gift of tongues was about. Nowhere does it say that at all. In fact, the Bible says the exact opposite. The gift of discernment is what that was for. The gifts were signs to unbelievers, the scripture says. Tongues are a sign not for believers but for unbelievers. 1 Corinthians 14.22 they were signs to unbelievers, not to the church. Yes, signs and wonder follow them that believed, but they also could be faked. And the church needs the gift of discernment as well as rightly divided doctrine and the word of God to be able to tell what the real deal is and what's fake. It may sound subjective but when you've experienced the real deal you can spot a fake you feel it in the depths of your spirit what's real and what's not in the next episode we're going to talk about the rules for tongues in the church we're going to talk about their operation and the dangers of emotionalism Eventually, we're going to get to the other gifts of the Spirit in this season, but there is so much ground to cover about tongues because all of the confusion that is surrounding them today. Until next time, this has been Episode 2 of All About Pentecost. God bless. Well, that's all the time. 
that we have for today. And I just want to thank you for watching. If this show or the other shows that we're producing and other things that we're doing at Cross Life Church, if these things are a benefit to you and they're feeding your spirit and your soul and helping you in your walk with the Lord, would you consider being a, a financial supporter of this ministry? There's a lot of things we want to do. We want to, uh, we need better camera equipment. We need better audio equipment. We need to hire some help uh, to be able to do more and more. There's a lot of things we want to do that we're just not there yet. Uh, but you could help us get there and help us get this message into more homes and saving more lives with the gospel of Jesus Christ. You can send your gifts to the address on the screen right there, or you can go to our website, www.crosslife.tv, and click on the donate button there. Everything is a tax deductible donation. Now listen, 100% of these funds are gonna go into this ministry buying the equipment and getting out into a larger audience. It's not going to go into padding my salary. I get a very, very, very small salary. And in fact, some weeks I go without a salary so that I can purchase equipment needed to make this possible. Uh, and so 100% is going to go into this ministry. It's all 100% tax deductible. And I can tell you, as you've seen if you've watched these shows, this is good ground to sow seed into. We cannot do this without help, and you can be a partner in taking the gospel to the world. Now listen, if you do so, God's not going to bless you with a million dollars in return. God's not a piggy bank. Uh, he's not a slot machine. You don't get to put a dollar in and get a hundred back. But what happens is when you give to allow the gospel to go forward, God does bless you in return. You're blessed by the gospel itself and God blesses you and holds to your account the lives that have been reached because you made it possible. If you can't give financially, keep supporting us by watching it and keep supporting by praying because that's the most important thing that you can do is to pray for us. Until next time, we'll see you later. God bless.